Thank you for joining today in our Side by Side. And this is our 75th recording for the year 2021. And on an occasion like that, it's just an opportune time for me to say thank you for being here alongside. And also just to express my thanks for those who've been praying and encouraging and sending from time to time little messages that remind me that out there, there are people who are listening and find some help in what we are doing And I would just also encourage you that if there are questions you have, things that is you would like us to answer even publicly, subjects, passages, or themes that you'd like us to pick up on our side by side, I'm only too glad to be able to do that. So you know you can connect with me at John Kirkpatrick at 56, sorry, John Kirkpatrick 56 at gmail.com. And if you want to, that's fine. I'd be glad to correspond with anybody on any questions at all. It's great to hear from you. Today I want us to continue as we were thinking yesterday, and I think it's not inappropriate on a 75th day to think about a subject like this that is so, so important. In a book by Desi Alexander, T. Desmond Alexander, called From Eden to the New Jerusalem, he says this, There is not a book within the whole collection, that is, of the Bible, that can be interpreted satisfactorily in isolation from the rest. And I think what that's really reminding us is is the interconnectedness of Scripture, so that when we study one part of the Bible, we need to try to understand it in its context of the whole Bible. So as we were reading in Luke 24, the last few verses there, when Jesus said to the disciples that he, he opened their eyes and he was able then to explain to them the things concerning himself in, the, in the, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, so that they could understand concerning his life, his death, his resurrection, his sufferings. Jesus is saying is that the Bible as a whole is pointing to the one big narrative storyline, and that is himself. Jesus is the central character of Scripture. I said that yesterday we would go to Exodus today, to have a little think about how that might, what it might look like there as an example of this very truth that Jesus was saying. And it reminded me of a time, and I may have referred to this in the past, forgive me if I have, but my sister Emmeline used to do these little treasure hunts for me to keep me, I suppose, amused. I was 10 or 11 at the time, and she would make out clues. She would hide them all over the farmyard and the garden, and then there would be a prize kind of, they would lead to something at the end. And, uh, you know, for my imaginative little mind, it was absolutely brilliant. And I think that scripture is full of clues like that, that lead us on the treasure hunt, that leads us to the treasure of Jesus and the truth of who he is and how he relates to us and how we relate to him. But if you come to Exodus, I've often wondered this when I read the Bible, did the characters at the time really know the part that they were playing in, in the great story of salvation? I don't think so. I don't think that they were all extremely conscious. I think some of them were conscious to a greater extent than others. And I think in their own eyes, this was life as it was. The main thing, I suppose, was dealing with where they were at that time. And thinking about Exodus, it was a very hard place. It's the place of slavery. It's the wilderness experience. It's the sufferings, it's the disciplinings, it's the journey to the land of promise. And when we look at the details of their lives, we can see that from our perspective, there were some very clear signs of what was to follow. This treasure hunt full of clues, each one with a special meaning. And of course, one anchor point in scripture I think that's very helpful is Galatians 4.4, which talks about the time fully coming. It says, so when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law. This idea that God has a timeline and everything is working towards that timeline and everything is moving in that direction and all the various parts have a a place within that. So thinking with that in mind, let me just refer to several issues from Exodus The first one is that Jesus will be seen to be the better Moses. Think about Moses' life. Now, I don't have time to read every text here, as you can understand. But you know maybe the narrative of his life. 
Moses is protected after his birth. Then he makes a journey into and out of Egypt. And then he goes through the water into the wilderness, where he is then tested along with all the others. We see how he taught and he lived out God's law, and how he becomes an intercessor for the people that he cares for, and that he is actually willing to die for his people. Those are all factual things that you and I can see as we study Moses' life in Exodus. But we can also see that they are all paralleled and actually heightened in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that Moses forms, as it were, a kind of a, a, a type of the Jesus figure, the deliverer who is to come. Creating in the minds of those who will read this an expectation and, and, and an anticipation. And when that one finally comes, a recognition that this is the one. But then continue through a few other things. Think about the Passover lamb. Yes, the Passover lamb was the lamb that was sacrificed and the blood was put on the doorposts and on the lintels. But in the New Testament, John the Baptist speaks of him as saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, he says, Get rid of the old yeast, meaning the kind of the sin and all the grumbling things. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And I haven't time to go into that in detail, but it's entirely embedded in the storyline of the getting rid of the yeast and then the Passover lamb in, the, in Exodus. We read about the perfect tabernacle that Jesus is. John 1 and 14 says that the word became flesh and not just dwelt among us, but the actual word tabernacle is used. And just as God limited himself, in a sense, in the tabernacle or came and met with the people there in the wilderness, Jesus is God come to us, tabernacled in human flesh. Think thirdly about how Jesus provides the light out of and in the darkness. The people went guided by the pillar of fire by day and the cloud, or sorry, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. And when Jesus spoke to the people, he said, Quoting from John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is also described as the manna from heaven. He himself speaks of this, John 6, which is just post-feeding of the 5,000, where bread, of course, was a very central part of that, the miracle of that feeding, the distribution of the bread, and then they go across the lake, the people follow him in their boats and so on. And Jesus says, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 6 verse 33. And then think about the rock at Horeb. And here we are quoting from 1, uh, from 1 Corinthians 10, 4, where we read, They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now, I don't have time to go into the detail of that, but if you look into 1 Corinthians 9 and 10, you'll discover the context of a community of God's people who are very, as it were, there's lots of turbulent things going on. There's idolatry, there's sexual immorality, there's division, just like it was in the Old Testament in the Exodus. And Paul is using this, uh, he talks about it, they were examples for us, they were examples. But it, implicitly he applies the place of Jesus and the person of Jesus and the rock that was struck as, as referring ultimately to Christ as a type of who Jesus is. And then if you go back to Luke 9, 31, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there we have this high point in the life of Jesus where he meets with Moses and Elijah, representing law and prophets. And he speaks there about his, his exodus. That's the word that is used. So even the very death of Jesus in some way is understood to be an exodus. And I, I think all of these things together point to you and I, or point us to the clues that are throughout the Old Testament where Jesus is to be discovered in so many marvelous ways. And it fills out for us, and it, it would prepare for us and equip us to understand more when he finally did come. 
And, and that's just a little illustration for you and I this morning. I'm just using that to help us see how this works. Any book in the Bible, you can see Jesus there and coming with our eyes open and our hearts saying, Lord, please open to me your word, your word that I may behold as David did the wonderful things within it. I think we'll see Jesus and I think we'll see things more fully and we will get the treasure and that will be a wonderful experience. So I hope this is helpful in a way to help you as you think about the Bible. The Old Testament is not just a lot of moral stories put together to teach us how to live. It's first and foremost the story of Jesus as the whole Bible is God's love for you and I through him.